God gives grace. Proverbs chapter 3, 31 to 35 reads, Do not envy the oppressor and choose none of his ways. For the perverse person is an abomination to the Lord, but his secret counsel is with the upright. The curse of the Lord is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the home of the just. Surely he scorns the scornful, but gives grace to the humble. The wise shall inherit glory, but shame shall be the legacy of fools. Solomon penned those words in Proverbs chapter 3, 31 to 35. We want to note that there are times that we face temptations, tribulations, and sufferings. God knows our weaknesses, and God gives the grace to humble. Do your best to follow the will of God, trusting in him with the hope of eternal life. Today we're going to look at this passage verse by verse and also look at some other passages in the New Testament that relate to the one here in Proverbs. What application do they have for us today? These questions will be in our mind today as we study these verses. In verse 1 he says, Do not envy the oppressor and choose none of his ways. We want to note first in verses 1, 31 to 33, that the Lord is pleased with the upright. He begins by saying, do not envy the oppressor. The oppressor is one who would crush or burden others for his own advantage. Some versions read man of violence or violent. Here, the oppressor is one who possesses something that may be desirable to some people. Such things as money or power or fame. There are people who would envy such a person, seeing his advantage and desiring to possess the same advantage themselves. But here we have the wise Solomon admonishing his readers, his students, do not envy the oppressor. He continues, and choose none of his ways. Do not follow the immoral practices of the oppressor, Solomon says. You may be tempted to envy his advantage, to want it for your own, whatever it may be, but is the advantage worth the loss? What principles would you have to give up in order to have what he possesses? Those are good questions to ask the next time that we feel envy of someone else, the next time that we covet of our neighbors. Verse 32, he says, for the perverse person is an abomination to the Lord, but his secret counsel is with the upright. The first part of the passage, for the perverse person is an abomination to the Lord. That is, the per perverse person is one who has turned away or departed from the righteousness of the Lord. His ways are not aligned with the way of the Lord. Some versions here for perverse person read devious, and the Etymology of the word devious deals with someone who has went astray, someone who is lost. And so here we're talking this perverse person, this devious one, who is lost. He's went his own way. Here, his way is the way which is separate from the way of the Lord. The ways or practices of the perverse are said to be an abomination. The righteous nature of the Lord is contrary to these immoral practices. The picture is that of the Lord detesting perversity. It's not that the Lord detests the person, but that the Lord detests the perverse practice of the person. That is what is in mind here. 
Isaiah 9, 59 in verse 2, the Messianic prophet wrote, but your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. It is our iniquities, our sins, our transgressions which separate us from God. The last part of verse 32 reads, but his secret counsel is with the upright. While iniquity separates people from God, the Lord is close to those who are upright. The word upright is another word for the righteous. The words secret counsel or private counsel refer to the closeness of the Lord to the upright. Other versions read, he is intimate with the upright or the upright are in his confidence. These are all expressions of the closeness of the Lord to the righteous those who resolve to live a righteous life in the sight of God, to follow his directions. Solomon taught, lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. And so the upright heed the counsel of the Lord, and this brings them close to God himself. His secret counsel, his word, is with the upright. They follow his word, and so they are close to God. And so the first point, the Lord is pleased with the upright. Secondly, we see the Lord blesses the just. Verse 33, the curse of the Lord is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the home of the just. The Lord's curse while the righteous God is close to the upright, as we saw earlier, by his very nature, we see that he is apart from the wicked, that is, from the wicked conduct of these people. Such iniquity is contrary to his very nature. The Lord is absent from the house, from, from the house who chooses to practice iniquity, wickedness, perversity. These are things contrary to the counsel or to the will, the word of God. Earlier descriptions of the wicked include the terms oppressor in verse 31 and perverse in verse 32. The house which the wicked or the unrighteous is not blessed by the Lord. The noun curse here is contrasted with the verb blesses. There's a passage in Joshua 24 and verse 15 that I think points out the idea of the practices of the home, the people of the house. Joshua writes in Joshua 24, 15, And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. And then in the last part of the passage, he says, But as for me and my house... We will serve the Lord. It might have been in Joshua's day that some of the people would have chose to serve idol gods. But as for Joshua, as for me and my house, he said, we will serve the Lord. What will you choose to do? Who will you serve? You might say, well, I serve no one but myself. And we'll see some of the problems with that later on in the, in the lesson today. But ultimately, whether we choose to believe or not, we serve one or the other. And so we either serve God or we do not serve God. Here, Joshua is saying, you do what you want to do, but as for me and my house, we serve the Lord. Of course, we have the freedom to make these choices. What will we choose to do? Secondly, we see... The Lord is gracious to the humble. Verse 34. Surely he scorns the scornful, but gives grace to the humble. The idea here of God scorn, scorning the scornful is in the sense that he resists or he opposes the proud, those who hold him and his righteousness in contempt, who would scorn him, mock him. The disciples, James and Peter in the New Testament, 
both refer to the teachings of God in Proverbs. Writing in James 4, 6, and in 1 Peter 5 and 5, God resists the proud. In the Septuagint, a Greek translation, early Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, we see that it is nearly identical with what we see here in James and 1 Peter. But let's compare what we see here in the Hebrew Scriptures, this, this particular translation, and with what we see in the New Testament Scriptures, with the translation that we have before us. God scorns the scornful, or he resists the proud. But it says he gives grace to the humble. The idea here that God gives grace to the humble. He favors them. In contrast, the humble may refer to those oppressed by the oppressor, like we see in verse 31, as suggested by other versions with terms like afflicted or oppressed. More importantly, there are the descriptions of their character, which include the upright in verse 32, the just in verse 33, and also the wise in verse 35. God gives grace. Another version reads favor. God gives favor. God resists those people who are proud and who regard him, his word, and his people with contempt. God favors those people who are humble, perhaps even oppressed, who act uprightly and justly, who wisely follow his counsel. And so while there are those who would mock God and his righteousness, his people, we see that God favors, shows grace to those people who are humble, people of humility, who are willing to follow the will of God, to put aside their own will and to follow his will, to trust that his way is the best way. Those who are overly prideful will certainly have difficulty with that task, but those who are humble, people of humility, will comply with God's will, will submit to him and follow his will. Verse 35, he says, the wise shall inherit glory, but shame shall be the legacy of fools. The wise shall inherit glory. In this passage, wise is contrasted with fools. The wise are said to fear the Lord, following his wisdom and his instruction. In Proverbs 1 and verse 7, Solomon wrote, the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. The reward for the wise is glory. Other versions read honor. As children receive the inheritance, the children of God will receive the glory of God. They will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 4. And so while the wise will inherit glory, the shame, that is, shame shall be the legacy of fools. In the context here, the term fool may depend describe the oppressor, verse 31, the perverse, verse 32, and the wicked, verse 33, the scornful, in verse 34. They are the opposite of the wise. They are proud and scorn the wisdom and instruction of God. The consequence for the fool is shame. Other versions read dishonor or disgrace. There is no inheritance, no legacy left for the fool. The inheritance, James 1 and 12, is said to be the crown of life. And in 1 Peter 5 and 4, the crown of glory. Let's look now at those passages in the New Testament. Learning from what we've seen here in Proverbs 3, and now looking at James 4, 1 through 10.
James 4, 1 through 10. If you will, turn to that passage and let's read that together. James wrote, where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have, you murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that the friendship of the world with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? But he gives more grace. Therefore he says, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and warm, mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Verse 1 through 5 describes pride and worldliness, while in verses 6 to 10 we see humility and godliness. Verses 1 to 5 here, James addressed his fellow Christians his brethren in Christ. He addresses how they would face temptations, which if yielded to would lead them away from God. By so doing, they would, in a sense, become enemies of God. In verses 6 to 10, we see humility and godliness, where God gives grace to the humble. He admonishes them to resist temptation, to repent of their sins, and how God will forgive and lift you up to glory. Let's look now at verse 1. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desire for pleasure that war in your members? James dis describes the disputes of brethren as wars and fights. They were not literally wars in the sense of countries warring with one another. Here we see him figuratively describing some of the brethren who fought amongst themselves, who disputed in, in some way. The conflicts of these brothers in Christ came from members individually warring within themselves with their own self, selfish desires for pleasure. The selfish pursuit of pleasure in this sense is a fruitless and dangerous course. The acts of wars and fights that happen in the world ought not to be happening with brethren in the church. Follow the words of wisdom as we see in James 3, the wisdom from above rather than what we see here in this world of strife and envy. Verse 2, he says, you lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight more, yet you do not have because you do not ask. As Christians, we learn to pray. Prayer becomes second nature. It's part of who we are day by day. As we see taught in the New Testament, pray without ceasing. It's a part of our day-to-day -day life. James here describes the frustration of the selfish with their own desires for pleasure. There are people who lust and do not have their desire for pleasure, satisfied, never satisfied. They are people who lust and commit sin. The sins of murder and covetousness were also condemned under the old law. While they might not murder, and physically taking a life, would they hate? That's a good question for us today. Someone who may never imagine taking another life in the sense of murdering someone, would they hate their neighbor? Here we see that these brethren are, are no longer asking 
they're no longer going to God in prayer. For some, their selfish desire for pleasure had closed off this spirit of prayer within them. And so spiritual brethren who would normally pray and pray often, pray without ceasing, perhaps hesitate to pray or don't think to pray or don't ask as a humble person might do. It's not the idea of demanding anything from God, but the idea of humbly asking in prayer for the things that we need. Jesus taught us to ask in prayer. Jesus taught too that murder begins in the heart. It begins with anger in Matthew 5 and 21. Adultery also is taught to begin in the heart. It begins with lust. Matthew 5, 27 to 28. John the Apostle also spoke of those who have hate in their heart. He said in 1 John 3 and 15, whoever hates his brother is a murderer. No, he may not have physically taken a life out of malice, a forethought. But did he have hate in his heart? If you have hate in your heart, if you hate your brother, John says that you are a murderer in that sense. That's something to consider. The next time that we have unjust anger, we have feelings of hate for someone else or lust in our heart for another. Verse three, he continues, you ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. And so even when some of these people did ask, or did ask in prayer, they did not receive from God because of a wrong motive, wrong intentions. The reason is they ask amiss. They have a faulty way of asking. They ask wrongly or with the wrong motives. And so when they ask, they're not doing it for the benefit of themselves, for the benefit of others, or helping other people, or for other godly reasons but more of selfish concern of thinking only of themselves. All right to think of yourself. We ought to think of ourselves, but not only of ourselves. And so some people are selfish in that way. And so those who would ask in that, in that fashion, in a selfish manner, certainly ask amiss. They ask with the wrong intentions. The motive of spending what they get from God on their own pleasures. Verse 4, he says, adulterers and adulteresses. As with murder and covetousness, adultery was condemned. We see that it was condemned in the Ten Commandments of the Old Law, the Law of Moses in the Old Testament. It's also condemned as practice of sin in the New Testament. However, in a figurative sense, adultery may also refer to spiritual adultery or unfaithfulness to God. As the act of adultery begins with lust, so their selfish desires for pleasure resulted in their unfaithfulness to God. Consider the following metaphor. The metaphor of a husband and a wife. The husband in the metaphor is Christ, and the wife is the church, the bride of Christ. The bride of Christ who once loved Christ, her husband, falls in love with someone else. In this, in this sense, the world. The world apart from God. The world is worldly society. The bride gives her love to someone else, to the world, that ought to have been given to her husband, Christ. And so this metaphor may help us to understand what we see here in verse 4. Adulterers and adulteresses, certainly men and women who commit adultery, who have relations that belong only to their spouse, they have relations with someone else other than their spouse, are guilty of adultery. However, think of this in a spiritual sense. Figuratively, adultery is referring to unfaithfulness to God. This is the way it's often used in the Old Testament as well. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity 
with God? Are we a friend with God? Or are we a friend with the world? Do we choose to serve God or choose to serve the things of the world? The friendship with the world here refers to a Christian's desires for pleasures in society in general. His lust and covetousness ultimately lead to forsaking the Lord and forsaking his people. Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 4 and 10, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. Some who are like Demas love the world so much that they leave God. They leave behind the people of God to follow the things of the world, to follow their own selfish desires, their own lusts of the flesh, as Paul warned about in the epistle to the Galatians. Verse 5, Paul says, or James writes here, Or do you not think, or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? The spirit here is most likely the Holy Spirit of God. As for the quotation, while there is no specific passage found in the Old or New Testament, the writings of the Old Testament do present God as a jealous God in the sense that he asks us for our faithfulness to him alone. Number of passages, Exodus 20 and 5, chapter 34 and verse 14, Deuteronomy 4 and 24, chapter 5 and 9, chapter 6 and 15, chapter 29 and verse 20. There are other passages as well. Time would fail us to look at all those today. After urging his brethren, James urges them to flee from idolatry. Paul wrote, or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? 1 Corinthians 10 and 22. In the Old Testament, idol worship was spoken of as provoking the Lord to jealousy. Would we provoke him to jealousy? Would we tempt the Lord? Deuteronomy 32 and 16. Deuteronomy 32 and 21 speak of provoking the Lord to jealousy. After prohibiting the worshiping of images, idols, God said in Exodus 20 and 5 and giving the Ten Commandments to the people of Israel, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. To paraphrase Paul when he says, are we stronger than he? That is, do you really wish to be the enemy of God? There's some difficulty in the translation here of verse 5, but I think any difficulty can be resolved by looking at the context of James. If you look at the previous chapter, James taught that wisdom comes from God, chapter 3, verses 13 to 18. The truly wise and understanding will show that he is wise and understanding by his good conduct. Actions do speak louder than words. The wisdom from above is said by James to be pure, peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. James 4 and 17. The brother who does these things is wise in the sight of God. Things contrary to the wisdom of God include having bitter envy and self-seeking in our hearts, James 4 and verse 14, which James described as being earthly, sensual, demonic in James 4 and 15. Envy and self-seeking are said by James to lead to confusion and every other evil thing. He concludes the chapter by saying, now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace, James 4 and verse 18. Unfortunately, not everybody today is concerned with making peace. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers in Matthew chapter 5, but unfortunately, many people take it to be troublemakers instead. Now in chapter 5, James describes those who with a proud heart promote strife instead of peace. James 4, 1 to 6, 
Here are people with hearts of bitter envy and self-seeking desires for pleasure, which finally end leading to confusion of hate and fighting with others. Rather than seeking the will of God, they seek to satisfy their own selfish will. God, however, asked his people to be people of faith. He asked for us to be faithful to him. When the Old Testament speaks of God being a jealous God, he's simply saying that he wants our devotion. He wants our love. As a husband or wife would want the love of their spouse. God asks for our faithfulness. The spirit who dwells in us yearns jealousy. God is a jealous God in that he asks for our love, for our devotion. Verse 6, James continues, you, but he gives more grace. And so, but he gives more grace. The passage reads, sorry for, for the typo. Uh, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Although people are susceptible of having a self-seeking heart, we have our weaknesses as people. With a desire for pleasure and to sin, there's hope. God gives more grace. While God resists the proud, those who would rather be friends of the world and follow their own selfish desires, God gives grace to the humble. God favors those who are willing to submit to his will. I highlighted the quotation from the Old Testament book of Proverbs that we looked at at the beginning of the sermon today. God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Proverbs 2 and 34. In verses 7 to 10, James teaches the lesson of submitting to God. Verse 7, he says, therefore, that is, because God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble, that is, because God is willing to give more grace to the humble, those who recognize their weaknesses, and those who by humility put their trust and faith, put their trust in God, he says, therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Here we see the idea of resisting temptation. Jesus himself was tempted by the devil. He endured temptation by quoting the scriptures, by appealing to the will of God. Not my will, but your will be done. This was the prayer that he prayed in the garden prior to the cross. And so resist temptation, resist the allure of the slanderer, the devil. Draw near to God, he teaches. Proverbs 2.32, but his secret counsel is with the upright. And so God is close to those who are upright, who are righteous, those who humbly trust in him. Submit to God, and so humbly yield to his will. Instead, resist the devil. Sometimes people resist authority in all forms. As Christians, we accept the authority of Christ. And we do the things that Christ has said to do. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things that I say to do? Good question. If we truly do believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, then it would be reasonable for us to submit to the will of, of the Lord, to obey his will. Submit to God, but also resist the devil. Endure temptation, James teaches in his epistle. Verse 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Here we see the idea of repenting of our sins and hypocrisy, of being of a contrite heart, of humbling ourselves in the sight of the Lord. Drawing near to God, we mentioned earlier from Isaiah that it is our iniquities that separate us from God. Repent of your sins. Change your heart. 
and turn to God. And by so doing, we see as we draw near to God, he will draw near to us. The idea of cleansing our hands, he's not, he's not talking about physically washing our hands, but the idea of hands representing action, taking action, that is, repent of your sins, change your heart, but also make restitution if possible, change your conduct, not only your, your, your words, but your conversation conduct. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Not like Pilate who washed his hands of the blood of Christ. I'm not responsible. He was, we might paraphrase that he was saying, I'm not responsible for what you are making me do and having Jesus crucified. He washed his hands of the, of the business, we might say. Here, cleanse your hands. The idea of repenting of our sins, of turning from those evil practices sinful practices, purifying our hearts, the idea of, of believing and obeying the gospel, and by so doing, we purify our soul. Peter taught that in his epistle. You double-minded, the idea of being hypocritical. Perhaps we profess to serve Christ, but we deny him in works. We deny him in our conduct. James said that if you're truly wise, show you're wise by your conduct. Show that you truly do follow Christ. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. This isn't a passage about gloom and doom. This is a passage of contrition, of being of contrite heart, of feeling bad for the things, the sinful things that we have done. And so rather than laughing, making sin a laughing matter, turn from sin, change your heart. And instead of laughing about sin, mourn over sin, that kind of attitude will help to, to us to live a, a faithful life, a righteous life, a moral life. Verse 10, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Jesus taught as much in Matthew 23 and verse 12, and whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. James mentions the proverb of Solomon, but so does Peter. In 1 Peter 5, 5 to 11, 1 Peter 5, 5 to 11, if you will, turn to that passage where Peter writes, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourself to your elders, yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care on him, upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a little while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Peter teaches elders to lead by example. He encouraged them to serve as overseeing seers, willingly and eagerly, not out of compulsion or not out of greed, but as examples to other members of their congregations entrusted to them to shepherd. In 1 Peter 5, 5 to 7, he teaches the lesson of being submissive. Verse 5, we see Peter teaching them to be submissive to one another, to be clothed with humility. Of course, figuratively, the idea of wearing humility, that it ought to be something, something seen, not that we're boasting, but the life that we lead can be seen in our, in our conduct, the things that we believe. Here he quotes from Proverbs, again, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. As in James 4.10, Peter encouraged the brethren to humbly seek the will of God, trusting that he will lift you up in the end. Finally, we will receive the crown of glory. 
1 Peter 5 and verse 4. Humble yourself, he said, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. God asked us to do these things because he cares. Verse 7, in humbling ourselves, we trust God's grace, casting our care on him, knowing that he does care for us. Verses 8 to 11, we see the need again to submit to the will of God, to resist temptation, the allure of the devil, to be faithful, to know that temptation and tribulation in the world is only for a little while in comparison to the grand scale of God's eternal glory. And so here he says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And so we need to treat sin seriously. Resist him, that is the devil, steadfast in the faith. Be faithful to, to God. Serve him as we are called to do. Take heart, too, knowing that you're not alone, that others are enduring the same sufferings or temptations or tribulations in the world around us. Verse 10, but may God of all grace, may the God of all grace, this is the same God who gives grace to the humble, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, the God who promises the faithful eternal life, the crown of glory, the crown of righteousness, after you have suffered a little while, a little while, looking at our life, life is short, especially in comparison with eternity. But after we have suffered a while, after we've been tried in this world, perfect, establish, and strengthen, and settle you, these hardships can actually be a benefit. The things that we suffer in this life can have value. Nobody enjoys suffering. But there is some value in the suffering if we persevere, if we learn. He concludes with praise to him be, that is to God, be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. A few key points to consider today. Note that Solomon in Proverbs 3 and 31 admonishes the oppressed not to envy the oppressor, the perverse, the wicked, the scornful, and the foolish. God is pleased with the upright. He blesses the just. He gives grace to the humble. And he teaches us to remember that the wise will inherit glory. In James 4, 1 to 10, in the previous chapter, James admonished the brethren not to have bitter envy and self-seeking in their hearts, but to show wisdom by their good conduct, James 3, 13 to 18. Now, James describes how those with a proud heart who seek to satisfy their own will, promote strife rather than peace. God asks for faithfulness, James 4, 1 to 5. Again, James quotes Proverbs to show that there is hope for the humble, James 4 and 6. Therefore, submit yourself to God, James 4, 7 to 10. And last, in 1 Peter 5, 5 to 11, Peter encouraged the elders to shepherd the flock with the hope of the crown of glory. In 1 Peter 5, 1 to 4, now Peter quotes Proverbs to support the admonition that the brethren ought to be submissive to each other, as well as to God, to be clothed with humility. 1 Peter 5, 5 to 7, he concludes, therefore submit to God, resisting temptation. Today as Christians, I want you to be encouraged by the message of Solomon, and of the Christians, the disciples, James and Peter. Learn from them. You're not alone. The things that you suffer are shared by your brotherhood and the world. Learn from one another. Gain strength from each other. Put your trust in God and humbly follow him. Sometimes we, we, we seek to do the things that we want to do, and that's fine. We, we take care of our own business our own needs, but we ought not to be selfish and put our own needs always ahead of everyone else, to only think of ourselves. Think of other people too, especially think about God and his will.
If you're not a Christian and would like to become a Christian, we urge you to heed the invitation of Christ, to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, and because you believe, by faith, repent of your sins, by faith, confess your faith in him, and by faith, be baptized for remission of your sins, Acts 2 and 38, Mark 16 and 16. We hope that you have been benefited by the lesson today. We invite you to return next time. And until then, God bless.